has expanded one of the world's largest travel companies to include over 150 travel booking sites across more than 70 countries. A self-proclaimed sci-fi aficionado, please welcome President and CEO of Expedia Inc., Dara Khajra Shahi. Welcome, Dara. And, Thank you. And happy birthday. Didn't Expedia turn 20 years old? Yes, year? very recently. We're getting old. Yeah, I wouldn't We're say trying that. trying to stay young. Trying yeah. to stay young. And you've been there 11 of those years, so you've been there more than half the lifespan of Expedia. I have, and we've survived through it. And you survived through it. So how do you stay focused on the core proposition of what Expedia is and was when you joined the company 11 years ago, and then as well, and then diversify into new areas? Well, I think you, um, I always believe that in order to solve problem, you want to break them down into component parts. And in designing kind of the Expedia ecosystem, we are consistently trying to uh, split different activities within the company uh, into smaller parts that are not dependent on other parts of the business to do their job. So that you create small teams that have very, very clear goals and metrics, et cetera. Uh, you put le good leadership on top of them, you put good technology teams there, and then you let them go. And then that allows you to, once you get this kind of team and machine that is, has clarity, uh, is moving forward without having to ask for permission, and is constantly getting better as a leadership team, then you can kind of turn to other areas of opportunity. Uh, and it's, it's a design structure that you um, try to put in place in actually technology stacks. And we're trying to do the same thing essentially in our business stack. And it's worked so far, and hopefully it'll continue to, to work for us. So a big piece of that strategy is your new platform. Yep. And you invested, what, over $800 million in building the new platform? We're, we're going to get to be spending overall as a company close to a billion dollars in technology a year. So it's, it's building, and, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to, to, to see pretty good returns. Okay. Now, you had some hiccups along the way. So I want to ask, what did you not anticipate in terms of the gravity of building the platform? Oh, God, uh, the, the list goes on forever. So it's always tougher than you expect. Um, it always takes longer than you expect. And I think if there's one thing that, that I would redo is, is actually to be more patient. Um, we try to do too much too fast. Uh, and often that required a very high level coordination of work between different teams. And instead of breaking the task down into smaller component parts, we were trying to take big, giant parts of the stack and move it over. Uh, and, and that's just much, much tougher. So as we kind of matured as a company, as a technology company, when you look at how we integrated, let's say, Travelocity onto our tech stack and Orbitz onto our tech stack, it wasn't a big, giant integration. I was taking different parts of that uh, of the component product and moving it onto our uh, front end, which meant that all the back end got integrated. But it, it was fundamentally, I'd say, engineering solution. Uh, and if I, if I had to do it all over again, I'd be listening to my engineers a heck of a lot more than building so you, you know, beautiful boxes on whiteboards. So you were very ambitious, and you just wanted to get it done as quickly as possible. We, we didn't know how to get it done. I, I, think, I think a key um, religion that we have now is to take on the smallest problem we can. You know, the, the best engineers are, are cheaters by nature. They, they never, if there's a big problem, they keep reducing the problem and try to reduce the, uh, solve the smallest problem and then get to the next one and get to the next one and get to the next one. We were trying to, you know, solve the whole thing. And I think it's a fundamentally different approach now and, and it's a better approach uh, because it, it allows you to adjust much more quickly than taking on these big, giant projects. So now back to business. How do you monetize the platform? And for example, we have few initiatives. We have long tail initiatives, obviously, mm -hmm. um, with activities and um, images, vacation rental, sure. and, and you know, maybe you're thinking of some others as well. And let's start with that and then you know, talk about Marriott and what the, that licensing agreement entails. Well, it's, um, 
more and more as we're building out this platform, the, the platform is architected in a way it, that makes it very flexible. Uh, and essentially the same core technology that allows this platform to power multiple brands uh, will allow it to power third parties. Uh, so we have essentially given Marriott access to um, our package technology uh, stack. It's the same stack that Expedia runs on. So to the extent that Expedia is improving, Marriott Vacations is improving as well. Uh, and they've seen very solid double-digit growth as a result of it. And, and we, are, we will be able to uh, essentially open up our technology stack more and more to a number of partners on a global basis. So this is just a start for us. So how do you prioritize restaurants, activities, parking, vacation yeah. rental? Obviously, you prioritize vacation rental. Yes, I mean, vacation rentals, we certainly prioritize with our pocketbooks. That's our largest acquisition uh, with HomeAway. And, it, and it's an enormous opportunity. It's a $100 billion plus opportunity. Uh, that team is super, super focused now and investing very aggressively in building out that tech stack, taking it, taking it transactional. Um, but also, we do think activities, the, the subject matter that, that was just spoken about, you know, that is a very large opportunity in and of itself, but it also helps us create more touch points with our consumer. We find that the greater the frequency of our touch points with our consumers, the greater loyalty they have, and the key there is to um, make the touch points uh, very much not just about an upsell, another upsell, uh, but make them based on context of what that consumer is doing and hopefully make that connection a delightful one, which can really increase loyalty back to you as a result. So $130 billion opportunity, yes. activities. Yes. And what are you doing in this space? Well, we, are, uh, we have a uh, local expert group. Um, it is probably the newest part of our technology stack, um, fastest growing part of the business. And I think as far as uh, activities goes, we are one of the top players on a global basis. Um, we are marketing very aggressively on a standalone basis. Uh, it is becoming an increasing part of our app now so that we know you're in market, we know that you've flown to Los Angeles, here are things that you can do. Uh, and so increasingly now our work on the activities front is to upsell you based on the context that we have regarding where you are in your trip, etc. And for us, it's not just activities. It's um, cars and cabs to the airport, from the airport to the hotel, from the hotel, et cetera. We have a uh, treasure mine of data about what consumers are actually doing because they booked it through us. Uh, and we think activities are a terrific opportunity to put that data to use. The additional factor that we have is that any time that we can combine multiple travel elements into one transaction, uh, we get to deliver often very, very attractive discounts to our consumers. So that's a different angle for us that's a bit of a unique angle because we're in the multiple kind of uh, line of business. So I wanted to ask you about that because, you know, dynamic packaging, you don't hear that much about it anymore. And are people yeah. doing it? I mean, are they taking air, our car, hotel, and activity and really pulling it together at once? Or do we still kind of doing these you know, linear, individual segments. So it's actually one of the most, um, I think, exciting opportunities that we have ahead of us. Uh, the way that dynamic packaging was architected in the past was, like you said, we would build out a very separate path for each different package and you could only buy flight plus hotel or flight plus hotel plus car. You know, we would, we would define how you'd buy it and we'd also time segment it. You had to buy it all together in order to get the discount. Um, where we are going is to a world that looks much more like a shopping cart. You know, the, you can take a flight and put it in a card, hotel, car, et cetera, so that you're gonna be able to combine multiple products any which way you want, all with kind of one look and feel versus all these different paths. And we're taking, in many, many cases, the time segmentation out, which means if we know that you've, you have bought a ticket to Los Angeles during these dates, we will allow you to search for hotels in Los Angeles and only you to search for hotels in Los Angeles and get the kind of net rates that were previously available only if you made the transaction together. 
and that's available now. And if I'm a hotelier in Los Angeles, I know you're coming in. So you're going to show me different. And, and, and it doesn't undercut retail because, again, it's a total one-to-one -one kind of marketing that we're doing. But is it opaque or do I see the price? No, you see, you see a discounted price. Mm -hmm. And again, it is something that only you see, mm -hmm. right? So that is something that's happening right now. And if you put together, and, and I'd say on the shopping path, we are midstream. We're testing and learning right now as far as kind of creating a much more you know, Amazon-like retail experience. You know, take this, put it up in the shopping cart, et cetera. Uh, and then the second part of taking this, forcing you to buy it all together, that is already happening as we speak. And for example, with our hotel product, we're offering it right now, and it's proven to be very, very popular. So will there be other agreements like the Marriott one? We hope so. We hope so. I mean, one agreement that's not exactly like Marriott that, that we announced actually was with Best Western in Germany. And there, actually, we are powering uh, Best Western meetings. So you can book meetings online. You can book your food service, et cetera. Again, all automatically online. It was a little product that... Uh, uh, Got a new space for you, meetings? You know, it was, um, it, it was a small bet made by uh, a couple of engineers in Europe, and they wanted to go uh, build it for us and see what happens. Uh, and they built it, and it's pretty good. So now we are powering it uh, uh, Best Western, and it could become something that's productized at scale. But that's the, you know, the, 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 the sensibility that we have now is, hey, let's go try something, mm -hmm. build it on the cheap, and I think this thing can really turn into a pretty exciting initiative for us. So let's move on to hotels, our favorite, yes. our favorite subject. And hotels always, you know, they love to hate Expedia. And there's been a lot of hullabaloo about their loyalty rates. Mm -hmm. And your own Melissa Mayer did some interesting math. And she's like, look, guys, you know, you're giving your best rates to your best customers. They're going to come to you anyway. And maybe that doesn't make a lot of sense. So do you feel like the hoteliers are really going to be able to move the needle towards their direct channel because of these loyalty rates? Well, I think that they will be able to move the needle. The question is, at what cost, mm -hmm. uh, right? It's, it's, I think that um, the marginal cost of a new consumer who is not your core consumer is always going to be much, much higher uh, than the next consumer or the core consumer. And I think one misperception about OTAs in general that hotels have is they are comparing the cost of acquiring the OTA consumer to the cost of acquiring the core business consumer. And the fact is that the OTA consumer is not loyal to any brand. They are not loyal to a specific hotel brand, typically. Um, for example, on Hotels.com, the top chain in the world gets searched for specifically 0.5% of our searches. Right? These are consumers who, who want a hotel uh, you know, in downtown in Los Angeles, and, and they want to see what's available to them, and they're stating that they're not brand necessarily loyal by coming to our sites. Mm -hmm. uh, so any time that you acquire this consumer that's kind of outside your core, the cost may be higher. Any time you go and get a consumer from Japan or Brazil, the cost may be higher because actually the utility is higher. Uh, and so we think that to the extent that hotels are not delivering the best prices in our marketplace, uh, they will get penalized because conversion will move down in the marketplace, and that's natural. So they will lose share in our marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I think what's going to happen is some of these hotels are losing share in this uh, customer who normally they would have a hard time finding. Mm -hmm. And so back to your question is, they can acquire more customers at what cost? We think we're a pretty efficient uh, platform. And, and you know, we'll see how it turns out over a period of time. But they are amassing a lot more loyalty members. And like some of the chains are saying, oh, we're doubling you know, the number because obviously you're going to sign up. It's a free program. And if you could save 3%, 10% or what have you. So yeah. now they're getting all this content, all this information that you know, they can use to kind of bring in more, more customers. And uh, do we have, we have a slide here I just wanted to show as well, looking at uh, loyalty. And, and the question is, you know, is that um, what you're doing with Red Lion in, and maybe you could explain it a little bit. How does that go, going to also impact your loyalty program? Because do I need to be a member of the Expedia loyalty program to be part of the Red Lion loyalty program? And then, you know, what is, you know, 
everyone talked about, well, there's double, they're double dipping. Because as you can yeah. see, the hotel loyalty programs are more popular, but OTA, I would say your you know, loyalty programs are gaining ground. Yeah, we, we have and over. Now they become your customer. Well, we have over 50 million loyalty members now mm -hmm. on a global basis across our different brands. Hotels.com uh, loyalty program just being absolutely dynamite. What, what we've done with uh, Redline is essentially allowing them to sign up Expedia customers as loyalty members. Uh, and we saw quadrupling in the number of loyalty members that they signed up. And you know, one open question as to the, some of the larger chains acquiring loyalty members are, are they just stealing loyalty members from each other? Uh, what I can tell you is based on the makeup of our audience, I'm highly confident that these loyalty members that we are passing on to our lion is, are, are new. They're net new customers. This, this is extending um, uh, their customer relationships. And our view there is we're allowing customers to self-select. If we give customers choice and if they want to join that loyalty program, then we've offered them a service. We're just going to make it as smooth and frictionless as possible. Uh, so we will continue to do this. And by the way, if they want to be an Expedia loyalty member, great. If you want to double dip, fine. But I don't have to be an Expedia loyalty member to take advantage of no. the red line in rates. No. No, you can double, double dip, which is great. But for us, I, I'd say in general, a pattern that you're seeing is we're opening up our marketplace. Um, we're not in it to own the customer. On the internet, you can never own the customer. We're, we are out there to create, to facilitate as much as we can in an incredibly easy and delightful way. And we think this is yet another tool that'll grow over a period of time. So Redline, they're kind of a mid-sized or a smaller, I'm sorry, just um, we'll get there in one second, Mark. So um, do you see more, more chains, larger chains signing into the program? I think that we will first see mid-sized chains. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that they are, in general, a little bit more open. They don't have as many assets as the global chains do. You know, the global chains are pretty powerful entities with very strong technology capabilities and loyalty capabilities and brands. So I think naturally we will start with the mid-scale folks, and then hopefully we'll move our way up from there. Okay, great. Mark? Hey, Dara, could you talk about the um, pink picture of the upside of the uh, homeway integration of that inventory onto the Expedia platform? If everything goes well, what do you think that will actually do? Do you think it'll bring new customers over that never bought on Expedia before? you think you'll be able to take match rates and dramatically improve them and dramatically improve conversion rates? If everything goes well, what's the upside? Well, I think the upside first is going to be um, that the consistent pattern that we've seen is that the more supply that we have on an in-destination basis, the higher the destination conversion becomes. Uh, and the higher the destination conversion becomes, the more marketing dollars we can put to work in that destination. Uh, so first, it's just more supply means, means higher conversion. And I think that's going to help us very, very significantly, especially in the number of home away markets that are resort destinations uh, and, and kind of mountain destinations, et cetera. The opposite for home away is that home away is not strong at this point as far as their demand de uh, generation for urban destinations. So I think that it is going to give a bunch of urban demand for home away, which is going to allow home away to be much more aggressive in signing up uh, alternative lodging in urban destinations, and it's going to accelerate their supply signups as well. So we think it's going to be a win-win for Expedia and Hotels customers as well as home away kind of the home away community and the home away owner base. Uh, and we're pretty excited about it. Dara, Lorraine, we have another question to your right. Thank you. Uh, Dara, one of our innovators showed a very interesting kind of genome analysis of hotel preferences that uh, was very detailed, kind of a DNA of, of hotels. And you have so much information about customer preferences. I'm wondering if part of your technology initiative is similar. It's, uh, we're just getting started there. So I, I'd say the, the areas where we've done some experimentation is um, to the extent that you signed in uh, and, and we're trying to get more and more of our customers to sign in and you book with us, we will show you the hotels that you've booked and we will tend to sort hotels that look a lot like the hotels that you've booked in the past. Do you like a hotel in the center of the city? Do you like boutique hotels? Do you like chain hotels? How much do you like to pay? So sort based on past behavior is one. Um, we are also looking at uh, 
marketing very much like Amazon, which is to the extent you're looking at this hotel, other customers also booked or looked at hotels just like this. But we are very, very early in that path, and I think there's a whole lot of experimentation to be done, and hopefully a significant amount of upside for us. Sure. I just wanted to get back to Homer real, real quickly. How many properties are online? Like, how is that onboarding going? You know, what's the plan? And then will that be integrated then into the search with hotels? So uh, we have 1.4 million properties total. Uh, over 1 million of them are now online bookable on HomeAway. Um, and we are going to start moving some of the online bookable and instant bookable HomeAway properties onto the Expedia and Hotels.com platforms, and it'll start happening this year. Uh, then it'll be a migration period uh, going to next year, and you know, really then we're gonna be testing and learning how do you sort this material, how do you present it and intermingle it with hotels so that it's a win-win for the customers as well as our owners. So I wanna shift gears a bit. We showed some data earlier from a survey that we took on Monday, gauging yeah. the sentiment in three European countries. And we found that about a fifth said they plan to travel to the US less because of the results of the election. Does that concern you? Uh, I would say, listen, concern, yes, but it's not a deep concern. We've been through um, environmental disasters, terrorist attacks, et cetera. This one's an election. Uh, people still travel. Uh, we've consistently seen that to the extent that there have been disturbances. It might change the shape of travel, but it doesn't. People still go on their vacations. They, make, they, they may make different choices. So I think our portfolio is broad enough where one way or the other, if people are going to find us, they're going to find us. We've got another question over to your On November 9th, you tweeted, as tech leaders, we have to admit that we are hugely disconnected with our nation. I don't like it, but have to recognize this issue. That's very powerful, Dara. Philip? Hi, Dara. As uh, voice-actuated assistants move from the edge, maybe to become more mainstream and artificial intelligence in general, with the initiatives, especially by Google and Facebook and the incredible amount of data they have, it's, it seems to be incumbent upon the giants like you and Priceline Group to do the same. How do you see that panning out? Do you think eventually everyone will be still neck and neck, or do you see this kind of AI making a difference on who wins and loses relatively? Well, I think we tend to ourselves and, and certainly Priceline as well, um, we have the ability to invest aggressively in emerging technologies uh, and platforms. And as a result, usually when those platforms emerge, we tend to take outsized share in the travel industry with the emergence of those platforms. And I think that voice is a new platform and it's a new way of interacting. Uh, I think it provides challenges in that the interaction becomes much more unstructured, right? It's we have been training consumers how to click their mice or their thumbs. With voice, you can't really train consumers, and the only training is if you get a null set, I'm never going to use you again. Uh, so I think that Facebook and Amazon and Google are going to be focused on taking the input and translating that input into some kind of structured query, and then we've got to uh, translate that structured query into results that are complete and appropriate. And I think we're very, very well positioned to do that because we have all the data and we have a breadth of travel data that other players don't. The other great thing about voice is that, you know, right now, uh, Google has a very strong gateway on uh, text search. Um, voice search, I think, as far as gateways go, is gonna be much more dispersed. You know, Amazon is a new player, Facebook is a player, et cetera. So we think the more gateways we have in a platform, the better off, and I think voice is gonna be pretty attractive for us. I don't know how big it'll get in the next two years, but in five to 10 years, I'm quite optimistic. Your uh, international business is what, 36%? Yes. Okay, where would you like that to be? Uh, I want it to be the other way around. So no, I want it to be, okay. you know, I think international, we want to get to two thirds versus one third. Okay. We have and, a work cut out for us. Okay, and last year, you said you were going to do China, go for China alone, get divested of Elong. How is that going? Uh, well, the divestiture was quite profitable, um, but in China, we are really focused on partnering up with Chinese players for outbound volume, offering them, we've got incredible worldwide inventory, we've got merchant inventory that you can combine into packages, 
um, and the EN business, especially their speedy affiliate network business, is really booming in China and especially in the Asia Pacific marketplaces as well. Uh, so we're pretty optimistic uh, there as far as a partnership route. And we are continuing to invest in Hotels.com. We just launched Expedia in China to focus on outbound. I think that's going to be a longer path. Uh, but you know, we're, we're pretty, uh, we stick to it. We're long-term investors. And I think China will be a nice market for us over the long term. How else can you participate in Asia Rising? Well, I think we're participating right now. You know, we're very good in uh, North Asia. I'd say we got to get better, uh, bigger in Southeast Asia. Uh, and China and India are enormous opportunities, but challenges as well for us. Okay. Book on Google, how is that working for you? Uh, we are in discussions with them. Uh, so I can't say that it's absolutely working, but we're optimistic. I mean, Google keeps building different ways for us to interact with them. Uh, and we engage with them in a very constructive manner. And we haven't found any channels on Google where we can't bid and we can't be a significant share player. Okay. And Adam said when we talked about Instant Book that maybe in the future Expedia will be a part of that? Yeah, I think it's a possibility. The, the Instant Book product now has much stronger branding as far as TripAdvisor's partners go. Uh, I think the brand branding's better. It's better for the consumer. There's less confusion. Uh, and so from a product standpoint and customer experience standpoint, we're much more optimistic. Now we have to make sure that the economics and kind of the integration uh, details and their important details work out. So we'll see what happens. They're a great partner and, and we'd love to work with them, but we do have, we're not there yet. Okay, great. So I'm getting the one minute sign and that okay. means it's time to play true or false. Oh Lordy, okay. We had so much fun doing this last year, so we're <laughs> gonna do it again. The Trafago guy is ready to move on. False, we love him. <laughs> But he is moving on. Yes, I know. But we love him still. Okay. <laughs> he's, he's a handsome guy. I'll tell him you said that. Thanks. I am glad I didn't invest in restaurants. In restaurants? True. Chat is the new black. Truish. I'd say chat more for customer service can be a great platform. I think chat for search uh, is is not particularly effective. I'm writing an even bigger check to Google this year. Very true. <laughs> Rob Torres owes me a drink. I'm ready for another big acquisition. False. <laughs> I need my piece. Facebook is the new elephant in the room. A uh, baby elephant. Hopefully they'll get to be a big elephant. And finally, I remember how I partied when I turned 20. I don't remember my 20s. Too far back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dara Kajwa Shahi. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much.